Congressman Ron Paul. A similar question to you, Congressman Paul. You have some bold ideas, some very fervent supporters, and probably the most organized ground campaign here in Iowa. But there are men, many Republicans inside and outside of this state who openly doubt whether you can be elected president. How can you convince them otherwise? And if you don't wind up winning this nomination, will you pledge here tonight that you will support the ultimate nominee? Well, you know, fortunately for the Republican Party this year, probably every, anybody up here could probably beat Obama. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so the challenge isn't all that great on how we're going to beat Obama. I think he's beating himself. I think really the question is, is what do we have to offer? And uh, I have something different to offer. I emphasize civil liberties. I emphasize a pro-American foreign policy, which is a lot different than policemen of the world. I emphasize, you know, monetary policy and these things that the other candidates don't, uh, don't talk about. But I think the important thing is the philosophy I'm talking about is the Constitution and freedom. And that brings people together. It brings independents in the fold and it brings uh, Democrats over on some of these issues. So therefore, I see this philosophy as being very electable because it's it's an American philosophy, it's the rule of law, and it, it means that, you know, we ought to balance the budget. It opens up the door for saying, uh, uh, supporting my willingness to cut $1 trillion out of the budget the first year. Well, as, as Governor Huntsman just mentioned, there is a real drama playing out real time in Washington right now with the threat of yet another government shutdown, the possibility that millions of Americans could see their payroll taxes go up. If you're president, as is the case now, and you're at loggerheads with one chamber of Congress, how would you handle this situation? <laughs> The main problem we have is the government's too big and the debt is too big and you have to cut spending. So you have to get people to come together. They've been coming together to increase the spending for decades. We have to get them to come together to do the opposite. But there are two factions up there. One want welfare and the other want warfare around the world and policing the world. So you go to the people who like the warfare and say, give me half of the cuts that have to be in the welfare. Go to the welfare people and say, you give me the cuts to cut the overseas warfare spending and bring people together and live up to what they say. Congresswoman Bachman. Congressman Paul, you are, and uh, having been in this town for, what, 48 hours now, you are all over Iowa TV these days with a negative ad about Speaker Gingrich. You accuse him of selling access and playing the corrupt revolving door game. What about the explanation you just heard that he's in the private sector and this is free enterprise? Well, he has a different definition of the private sector than I have because it's a GSC, government-sponsored enterprise. It's completely different. It's, it's a government agency. They get the money and sponsorship. They get mixed up. It's, it's the worst kind of economy. You know, pure uh, private enterprise, more closely probably what Governor Romney is involved with, but if it's government-sponsored, it's a mixture of business and government. It's very, very dangerous. Some people say if it goes to extreme, it becomes fascism because big business and big government get together. So yes, they get money. And I was talking about that for a long time, the line of credit, the excessive credit from the Federal Reserve, the Community Reinvestment Act. For 10 years or so, the Austrian economists knew there was a bubble. And at this time, nobody was listening or doing anything in the Congress. And then uh, to go to work for them and get money from them, it literally is government. It, it's, it's literally coming from the taxpayer. They went broke. We had to bail them out. So indirectly, that was money that he ended up getting. They're still getting money from us. Government sponsored enterprise. It's not a free market enterprise. Speaker Gingrich, 30 seconds to respond. Well, let me just go back to what I said a minute ago. The term government sponsored enterprise has a very wide range of things that do a great deal of good. Go across this state and talk to people in the electric membership co-ops. Go across this state and talk to people in the credit unions. There are a lot of very good institutions that are government sponsored. And frankly, the idea that anything which in any way has ever touched government could raise questions about doctors dealing with Medicare and Medicaid and a whole range of other government activities. There are many things governments do. I did no lobbying of any kind for any organization. And that was, that was a key part of every agreement we had. Congressman, Congressman Paul, as, as, as you've been warning, we are on the brink of another government shutdown because of spending that you've called out of control. But haven't you contributed to that spending problem yourself, sir, supporting 
over the years earmarks that have benefited your district and your state. Back in 2009, you explained this by saying, if I can give my district any money back, I encourage that. I don't think that the federal government should be doing it, but if they're going to allot the money, I have a responsibility to represent my people. Isn't that what they call a mixed message, Congressman? Well, it's a mixed question. This is a problem because the, the real message is you should include in your question, uh, also, you have never voted once for an earmark. Uh, no, it's a principle that I deal with because if, if, you, if the government takes money from you and you fill out your tax form, you take your deductions. I look at that the same way in our communities. They take our money, they take our highway funds, and uh, we have every right to apply for them to come back. Matter of fact, it's a bigger principle for me than that. I think this whole thing is out of control on the, uh, on the earmarks because I think the Congress has an obligation to earmark every penny, not to deliver that power to the executive branch. What happens when you don't vote for the earmarks, it goes into the slush fund, the executive branch spends the money, then you have to grovel to the executive branch and beg and plead and say, oh, please return my highway funds to me. So it's this whole principle of budgeting that is messed up, but I never vote... I never voted for an earmark, but I do argue the case for my, the people I represent to try to get their money back, if at all possible. But isn't that the same thing of having your cake and eating it, too? You can complain about earmarks, but then if there are provisions there that help your district or your state, that's different. If 434 other members felt the same way... Yeah, I don't, How I don't would we ever fix the problem? Yeah, but you're, you're missing the point. I don't complain about earmarks because it's the principle of, of the Congress meeting their obligation. But if everybody did what I did, there would be no earmarks. The budget would be balanced and we'd be cutting about 80% of the spending. So that would be the solution. But, but you also want to protect the process. You want to emphasize the responsibility of the Congress in not delivering more power to the president. I would be a different kind of president. I wouldn't be looking for more power. Everybody wants to be a powerful executive and run things. I, as a president, wouldn't want to run the world. I don't want to police individual activities and light their lifestyle. And I don't run, want to run the economy. So that's like an entirely different philosophy, but it's very, very much in our tradition and in the tradition of our Constitution. Congressman Paul, let me ask you, do you believe in, in what the two candidates have said, that it would potentially be okay to abolish courts like the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals entirely, or judges impeach them, if Congress and the President don't decide, decide they don't like their rulings? Well, the Congress can get rid of these courts. Uh, if, if, a, if a judge misbehaves and is unethical and gets into trouble, the proper procedure is, is impeachment. But to subpoena judges before the Congress... I'd really question that. And if you get too careless about abolishing courts, that could open up a can of worms because it, you, there, there could be retaliation. So it should be a, a more serious. Yes, we're getting very frustrated with this. But the whole thing is, if you just say, well, we're going to, okay, there are 10 courts. Let's get rid of three this year because they ruled a, a way we didn't like. Uh, th that, that to me is, I think, opening up uh, a can of worms for us and would lead to trouble. But I really, really question this idea that that uh, the, the Congress could subpoena judges and bring them before us, uh, that's a real affront to the separation of the powers. Governor Romney, uh, many people believe that the way to rein in so-called activist judges, and I just want to go quickly down the line with just a name, favorite Supreme Court justice. The Supreme Court. Congressman Paul? From my viewpoint, they're all good and they're all bad because uh, our country, <laughs> uh, <laughs> our country uh, a long time ago split freedom up into two pieces, personal liberty and li economic liberty, and the judges, as is the Congress, as, as the nation, think it's two issues. It's about one issue, so therefore Congress is split on this issue as well as our judges. Last chance to say your name. No, I'm not going to put it. I, all of them are good and all of them are bad. Congresswoman Bachman. <laughs> Fired up crowd, they're ready for hour number two, and we begin hour number two with an important topic, foreign policy. Congressman Paul, many Middle East experts now say Iran may be less than one year away from getting a nuclear weapon. Now, judging from your past statements, even if you had solid intelligence that Iran in fact was going to get a nuclear weapon, President Paul would remove the U.S. sanctions on Iran included those added by the Obama administration. So to be clear, GOP nominee Paul would be running left of President Obama on the issue of Iran. 
but I'd be running with the American people because it would be a much better policy. But for you to say that there's some scientific evidence and some uh, people arguing that maybe in a year they might have a weapon, there's a lot more saying they don't have it. There's no UN evidence of that happening. Klepper at the, uh, uh, in our national security department, he says there is no evidence. It's no different than it was in 2003. You know what I really fear about what's happening here? It's another Iraq coming. It's war propaganda going on. And, uh, and we're arguing, to me, the greatest danger is that we will have a president that will overreact, that we will soon bomb Iran. And the sentiment is very mixed. It's, it's very mixed even in Israel. You, you know, uh, there, the uh, head of the security for Israel, who just recently retired, uh, sa said that it wouldn't make any sense to do this, to take, take them out because they might be having a weapon. So I would say that the greatest danger is overreacting. There is no evidence that they have it. And it would make, make more sense if we lived through the Cold War, which we did, with 30,000 missiles pointed at us, we ought to really sit back and think and not jump the gun and believe that we are going to be attacked. That's how we got into that useless war in Iraq and lost so much Congressman, in Iraq. Congressman Paul, the, the question was based on the premise that you had solid intelligence. You actually had sol solid intelligence as President Paul. And yet, you still at that point would, would pull back U.S. sanctions and again, as a GOP nominee, would be running left of President Obama on this issue. Yes. All we're doing is promoting their desire to have it. Ehud Barak, uh, the uh, defense minister for Israel, said that, uh, that if he were in, in Iran, he would probably want a nuclear weapon, too, because they're surrounded for geopolitical reasons. So that's an understanding. So the fact that they are surrounded, they have a desire. And how do we treat people when they have a nuclear weapon? With a lot more respect. What did we do with Libya? We talked to them. We talked them out of their nuclear weapon. And then we killed them. So it makes more sense to work with people. And uh, the whole thing is that nuclear weapons are loaded over there. Pakistan and India. Israel has 300 of them. We have our ships there. We got to get it in a proper context. Right. We don't need another war. Understood. And you make that point quite a lot. I'm going to. I'll try one more time. Iran is reportedly running exercises on closing the Straits of Hormuz, a key passage, as you know, for global trade. Now, what should the U.S. response be if Iran were to take that dramatic step? With all, this is we're, the, the plans are on the book. All they talk about is when are we, the West, going to bomb Iran? So why wouldn't they talk about they don't have a weapon, they don't have a nuclear weapon, why wouldn't they try to send out some information there and say, you know, if you come and bomb us, we might close the Straits of Hormuz down. So already the president, I think, is wisely backing off on the sanctions because it's going to be an economic calamity if you take all the oil out of Europe. So I think that makes sense. He knows these, these uh, sanctions are overreaching. Sanctions are an act of war when you prevent goods and services from going into a country. We need to diff approach this a little differently. We have 12,000 diplomats in our services. We ought to use a little bit of diplomacy once in a while. Okay. Uh, just a, a reminder again, that little friendly beep is, is when you, you wrap up. Since and we all know what's going to happen. We know that Iran is going to be the hegemon and try to come into Iraq and have the dominant influence. And then Iraq will essentially have dominance from the Persian Gulf all the way to the Mediterranean through its ally Syria. And with all due respect to Ron Paul, I think I have never heard a more dangerous answer for American security than the one that we just heard from Ron Paul. And I'll tell you the reason why. And the reason, the reason, the reason why I would say that is because we know without a shadow of a doubt that with, w Iran will take a nuclear weapon. They will use it to wipe our ally Israel off the face of the map, and they've stated they will use it against the United States of America. Look no further than the Iranian Constitution, which states unequivocally that their, admission, their mission is to extend jihad across the world and eventually to set up a worldwide caliphate. We would be fools and knaves to ignore their purpose and their plan. Congressman Paul.
Obviously, I would like to see a lot less nuclear weapons. I, I, I don't want Iran to have a nuclear weapon. I would like to reduce them because there would be less chance of war. But to declare war on 1.2 billion Muslims and say all Muslims are the same, this is dangerous talk. Yeah, there are some radicals, but they don't come here to kill us because we're free and prosperous. Do they go to Switzerland and Sweden? I mean, that's absurd. If you think that is the reason, we have no chance of winning this. They come here and they explicitly explain it to it. The CIA has explained it to us. It said they come here and they want to do us harm because we're bombing them. What, what is the whole world about the drone being in Iran? And we're begging and pleading and how are we going to start a war to get this drone back? Why were we flying the drone over Iran? Why do we have to bomb so many countries? Why are we in, have 900 bases, 130 countries and we're totally bankrupt? How are you going to rebuild the military when we have no money? How are we going to take care of the people? So I think, I think this wild goal to have another war in the name of defense is the dangerous thing. The, dangerous, the danger is really us overreacting, and we need a strong national defense, and we need to only go to war with a declaration of war and just carelessly flouting it and starting these wars so often. Speaker Gingrich, is Congressman and Paul. Would be, can I respond to that? Can I respond? And the problem would be the greatest underreaction in world history if we have an avowed madman who uses that nuclear weapon to wipe nations off the face of the earth and we have an IAEA report that just recently came out that said literally Iran is within just months of being able to obtain that weapon. Okay. Nothing could be more dangerous than the comments that I, we I just heard. Answer. All right, 30 seconds. There, there is no UN report that said that. It's totally wrong on what you, what you just said. The IAEA that, that, is not, that, that is not true. They, they produced information that led you to believe that, but they have no evidence. There's no, been, been no enrichment and of these bombs. And if we agree with that, if we agree with that, the United States people could okay. be at she, risk she of our national security. Time, so I'd like, well, I'd like to finish. If she thinks we live in a dangerous world, she ought to think back when I was drafted in 1962 with the nuclear missiles in Cuba. And Kennedy calls Khrushchev and talks to him and talks him out of this and we don't have a nuclear exchange. And you're trying to dramatize this, that we have to go and, and treat Iran like we've treated Iraq and kill a million Iraqis and 8,000 some Americans have died since we've gone to war. You cannot solve these problems with war. You can solve the problems if we follow our constitution, go to war, only when we declare the war, go in and win them and get them over with instead of this endless fighting and and this endless attitude that we have an uh, enemy all around the world. But as president, I, think we've been pretty, I stand on the side of peace thank you. the American people. We've been, thank you, Chris. Candace, Ronald Reagan famously espoused his 11th commandment. Thou shalt not... I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, well let me just finish this question. We're running out of time. Ronald Reagan famously espoused the 11th commandment, thou shalt not spill, speak ill of another Republican. Yet, to varying degrees, during this campaign, you've all broken that, one way or another, broken that vow. So I guess the question is, how do you balance on the one hand, trying to win the nomination, with on the other hand, not weakening the eventual nominee to the point where he or she is less electable than President Obama? Congressman Paul. Well, you know, the media has a responsibility and we have a responsibility, and I think uh, exposing our opponents to what they believe in and their flip-flops. I think the reason maybe that we had to do more this year is maybe the media is messing up and they haven't asked enough questions that so we have to fill in and ask these questions and get this information out. So, uh, no, I think it's a responsibility on us. I think there should be lines drawn. I think uh, uh, there are some things below the belt. I don't think, but I, I don't like the demagoguing, the distortion and taking things out of context. I don't like that, but when they disagree on an issue, important issues, then we should expose